Good morning, buenos dias, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. We're very happy to have you join our last Dawn Talk of the year. A little bit of housekeeping first. We will be uh, having interpretation in Portuguese, French, and Spanish today. Uh, so the little globe down the, to the right of your screen um, will enable you to choose the interpretation channel. Habrá interpretación disponible para todas eh, y todos en el simbolito del globito que está al final de la pantalla, al, la parte de abajo a la derecha. Uh, also, we are excited to read your comments and, and be in conversation with you in the chat box and also uh, see your questions in the Q&A box. Um, my name is Masaya Yavanera Blanco. I'm a Venezuelan activist and feminist. I'm assistant professor of development studies. And most importantly today, I'm a member of DAWN's uh, executive committee. DAWN stands for Development Alternatives with Women for a New Era. We are a network of feminist activists and researchers from the global south that has been working for economic, social environment, and environmental justice since 1984. John has been actively mobilizing uh, dialogue and action since the start of the pandemic. One way has been pushing for the Feminist for a People's Vaccine campaign, which we co-lead with many valuable partners like the Third World Network. And another has been investigating how the political and policy world has changed drastically during the pandemic. Uh, in this spirit, we created the Dawn Talks uh, as a space for feminist conversations about the present and the future that we want. This time we will be discussing uh, how the financial world has become part of our everyday life and even more part of our survival. Finance, finance is cutting across our most basic needs uh, and it's really uh, reaching um, every part of our societies. We have the pleasure to speak about this with Lena Lavinas. Uh, Lena is a Brazilian economist and feminist. She's currently lever home visiting professor at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. She founded the feminist academic journal Revista Estudos Feministas in Brazil. She's a member of the feminist, um, sorry, uh, most of her research examines how welfare regimes and labor markets adjust to changes in contemporary capitalism, especially during the ages of financialization. Her focus is on Brazil and Latin America and countries of the global south. And her latest book is The Takeover of Social Policy by Financialization, The Brazilian Paradox, um, uh, which has uh, opened up the conversation about how finance has become also part of the social uh, policy world in the global south. She's published extensively on social policy, on gender issues and, and labor uh, market reforms. Uh, today, our conversation uh, will be um, basically an exchange with Lena, a conversation um, in which we will have the opportunity to discuss what financialization means, how that's part of our lives, why this is a feminist mm -hmm. issue, and why do we have to speak about it in the context of the global pandemic. And we'll also have the, the opportunity and the privilege to enter in conversation with Lucy Sibeco, Corina Rodriguez Enriquez, and Gita Sen. Uh, towards the end of the session. We will then open up for questions and, and uh, dialogue uh, with, with everybody that is joining us. Um, and uh, we'll uh, then close after that. So first of all, Lena, uh, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you so much for sharing uh, your work and your reflections with us. We're we're very happy to have you with us. Um, we wanted to start from the very basic. Why is a, what is financialized capitalism and how is it different from the capitalism we, we're used to speaking about in, in activist groups? You have to remember to turn on your, your mic. Oh, sure. <laughs> Uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening. I'm very happy to be 
here. Before answering the question that was asked, I would like to say that I'm very happy to be part of this last debate by dawn for the year. It's an institution that has been around for 40 years, but it has been renewing itself. It's in the center of the feminist debate in the four corners of the world, which is unheard of. Dawn has been giving voice and authenticity to the potential of change that we have with us, we women from the South, who have resilience, who have uh, the capacity to overcome difficulties. And now we have an international voice due to Dawn. So I would like to say, long live Dawn. I'm very happy to be here. I would like to thank Masaya and all the colleagues who have been part of the preparatory meetings of this event, and there were many. And this shows how much commitment you are embracing in your job, in your wonderful work. I would like to say that this talk of today is a result of our experience as activists, as academics, as professionals, and more than talking to you, I'm going to learn a lot from you today. Thank you all very much, and I would like to thank the interpreters and translators who were kind enough to accept the fact that I'm going to speak in Portuguese. Thank you very much. So, Masaya, what you asked was, how has capitalism changed? And it has changed a lot. Beforehand, we thought about factories and companies by the end of the 20th century, when workers could go on strike, when we struggled for better conditions of life, for reducing the workday, and fought for rights. And this idea of this capitalism, that was the capitalism of plants and factories, and most of all, of work, because the conquering of rights went through work itself. This capitalism has changed. But in the periphery, in our own countries, it was not like that in the factories itself. The struggles were on the street. Uh, where informality was present. On the street, women reunited to solve their daily problems, mostly in the rural areas. And at that time, the solution was to work more, work even more to uh, be, even outside the marketplace, try to solve uh, the daily needs, but the social expenditures in our countries was all, always very low because the oligarchies wouldn't allow for taxes to be uh, increased because they didn't want those taxes to finance the needs of the popular classes, the working classes, and mainly the women. Because we know that social politics influence women very much. If we think about capitalism in the rich countries, we thought as poor countries that we would get to their level. We thought that in the 50s and 60s that we would catch up with industrialization. We thought that we would be able to reduce informality, but there came a time when capitalism changed. It was in the 70s, and one of the reasons why there was a major crisis was that because the profits of the capitalisms, the capitalists were reduced uh, during the 60s, beginning of the 70s, due to several different factors that are part of this change. But capitalism undergoes a crisis because there is a drop in its profits. One of the reasons for this drop is that during the 50s, 60s, and 70s, in the developed countries, there was an advancement of the gains of the working classes. The workers received higher wages. The social expenditures 
also grew exponentially and due to the strength of the movement of the workers, both male and female, in the 60s and the 70s was a time where women entered the marketplace and the working place. And this uh, uh, changed the rhythm of accumulation that there used to be. And the crisis of the 70s, and I open a parenthesis, all the crises of capitalism is a time for restructuring capitalism, not only in the sphere of production economy, but in the sphere of reproduction. We have to understand that this is a time where everything changes place and the regime of accumulation of wealth, that is the basis of capitalism, changes. So we are going to see right now a radical change a contestation of the parameters of the principles that we used to have that helped the big expansion in the 50s to the 70s. Those were the years where we had more wealth production. Not The world had never been so wealthy, not the world had so big salaries, and we had to understand what this was possible. In 1960, for you to know, in the US, the marginal tax bracket of the 60s was 91%. That means the following. People that used to uh, earn $400,000, those were the so-called millionaires at the time, because now we have the billionaires. But the millionaires at that time had to pay 91% of the marginal bracket of tax. Now, those people would be equivalent to $3 million a year. Today, the maximum bracket for tax revenue in the US is 37%. From 91, with new liberalism, new liberalism, it dropped to 37. Biden is trying to put it up to 39%, so it would increase 2 percentual points, this maximum bracket. And he doesn't manage to do that. But capitalism is improving what we called a contract, the Fordist contract, that we didn't have in our peripheral countries. But that was like a horizon a place where we wanted to get to. But in truth, when people start, when things start changing, the entrepreneurs, the capitalists, vis-a-vis -vis the drop of their profit rates, are trying to find new mechanisms for profitability, ways of having more profits and making profits grow. So they changed to the financial sector that was expanding by financing productive activities. So this change is very important because it is this very change that together with the rupture that neoliberalism brings will allow for deregulation, for liberalization and for the markets of productive activities, mainly in financial products. So what we have to understand is that the rupture in the 70s that is going to be the reaction against the struggles and the progress of the working classes will bring transformations. And this comes together of what we think that is ideology simply neoliberalism, but no, neoliberalism, instead of saying this is everything a market and an expanding market, neoliberalism, although it brings about privatization, it can only be supported by the expansion of the financial sectors, because when the state retracts that the state doesn't provide social services anymore. So financial companies, insurance companies, occupy this place. So new liberalism is a new development of capitalism and is 
is supported by the growing financialization of all the social relations and the economic relations. It's not only financing expanding itself, but dominated, but dominating everything by searching financial returns, financial profits in everything that is done. Then there is an enormous expansion of financial costs. There are no controls anymore. There is a huge variety of non-monetary financial markets and the core of the financial capital is money. Money is the most liquid asset there is and not by chance investments are not going to be in the real sphere, in the productive sphere where I have to mobilize capital, I have to buy machinery, pay the people buy uh, inputs and in three years time the market may change and what I have produced is not so interesting anymore so my profit drops so we have a change of the reasoning of accumulating wealth for assets of high liquidity and so money is the most important thing in the process so we want assets that are highly liquid and don't mobilize capital. So the entrepreneurs in the productive sphere, they make money in the financial sphere, in truth. Some examples, the major companies, the big companies that sell uh, retail, uh, retail shops, so to speak, those are the companies such as people who sell the white lines and so on and so forth. These companies currently, they make money mainly by lending to the families that are already their clients. So the financialization process goes through the payment ways that are uh, supported by credit cards, debit cards. You are affiliated to these companies. Whenever I pay with a credit card, I'm paying interest. So interest is central to this new financial economy. The central mechanism for the accumulation of uh, wealth is the fact that the states have left this place. They have to be indebted in the financial markets we taxpayers also pay for these interests the companies also are indebted in a growing debt because they want to expand their, comp their competitiveness in the financial sphere so and also you have the families that also are indebted and this reasoning this logic of indebtedness goes through lack of jobs and in the rich countries informality has grown precarization has also grown in the marketplace and there is the retraction of the state it's a change in the provision that used to be uh, the state providing services as of health education, healthcare, in the third world, uh, university education is privatized. We have that in Brazil, in Chile, for instance. In Chile, the students organized a movement that is called uh, the educational debt, where the privatization of uh, university studies were uh, decided at the time of the dictatorship of Mr. Pinochet. So the families got indebted. So you have more than 2 million youngsters in Chile who are indebted. And there came a reaction. In the United States, the debt of the students is $1 trillion billion, which is impossible to be paid. But what is interesting is that the state lends money to the students, but the money goes directly 
to the private universities and colleges, and the debt of the students is with the state. So the private companies profit from that because irrespective of the quality of the uh, teaching they offer, they receive this loan that the state transfers for the companies immediately. And now the youngsters have to pay it back to the state with interest. But what happens is that the young people leave the university, go to the marketplace, and the conditions in this very marketplace are frustrating, the salaries are low, and sometimes these students cannot pay back these debts. So in the UK, in Brazil, in Chile, there is a growing debt of the students who will be in uh, not uh, uh, proper, have the chance to pay because I'm risking that we are having more and more debt. So we are accumulating debt. So that's what Mr. Biden, although everybody urges that he should abolish the debt of the American students, he will not do that because that would mean devaluing other assets that are linked to the debt of the students. So it is like a snowball, because we live in a world where more and more people are indebted. Just to uh, follow up with that. So when we're talking about how uh, our lives have become financialized, uh, it, it happens through everyday uh, services and, and things that we're, we consider our rights, like a right to education is now often um, say, uh, transits through the financial system. And you said something that I found very important earlier, uh, that when, about how when regimes of production uh, are linked to regimes of reproduction, which is something that we feminists have been talking for a long time, and, and a way in which that connection is very clear in the context of the financialization of, of life, uh, and, and policy is also through the cash transfers programs and the social policy. And it's one of the ways also in which this financialized capitalism is, uh, has expanded and reached uh, the global south the way it has. Um, so how do you think is, who, who do you think is winning in this, in this context? And how is the financialization of social policy uh, happening? So this is a very important question because in the developing countries, mainly the poorest in the world, we had never had a system of social protection, public retirement, healthcare programs like you have in the developed countries. In the 80s and mainly in the 90s, the World Bank was totally against transferring cash to the families, because what they said at the time, the World Bank, was that poor people don't know how to uh, spend money. They are going to spend it on alcohol, beverages, women are going to buy silly stuff, they are not going to take care of their families, but this is prejudice. Poor and simple, saying that the poor cannot allocate the resources they gain for their own needs. This was discrimination, pure and simple. Now, with capitalism being outsourced, even the World Bank has changed. Now, you have two million and a half people, one third of the world population, in the developing countries, in the poorest countries, that receive some kind of cash transfer from the government. And why has this generalized in Brazil, where there is a, a social protection system that was uh, created in 1988, 60% of all the social expenditure is by cash transfer. The expenditure in kind for 
health care, sanitation, um, housing, education, is a very small parcel. And it's being reduced all over. Why? Because for capitalism to expand, mainly in the developing countries and poor countries such as ours, the finance financialized capitalism needs collateral. Capitalism, if you loan money, if you are a bank to loan money, you must have some ins insurance that you are going to pay back. The poor, the working classes, this is a, data f a piece of data from Brazil. In 1970, only 10% of the adult population had bank accounts. In 2020, 95% of the adults in Brazil have a bank account, according to the Brazilian Central Bank. So this phenomena or this phenomenon could be expanded during the decade of the year 2000, from the year from the 20th to the 21st center, center this was possible due to adoption of these new programs that are the front to combat poverty. In places where people are poor, it's important for them to have access to cash, to money. But the first impact of these cash transfer programs is that they expanded the monetization of the families, uh, preventing the families to going back to the domestic sphere. So everybody's in the market. Secondly, when we open a bank account, you start having access to a series of other services. That is a funeral uh, help. You start by insurance that you didn't use to, but mainly with this small resource that the government pays you monthly, you start being able to obtain loans from the bank from the bank, even if it is a small loan, a small value. But as this cash transfer from the state is a guaranteed uh, income, it's, it becomes a collateral. What is a collateral? A collateral is an insurance. It can be a, a car, it can be your house, it can be a piece of jewelry, but more and more, a bank is not interested in having a piece of jewelry because it's not liquid. Uh, an old car, a used car has no liquidity. If you stop paying the debt, the bank has nowhere to sell that. That's why the states, by following the G20, the IMF and the World Bank, that's why the in 08, everybody got together to guarantee that the social policies, mainly in the developing countries, would be essentially cash transfer to the families, even in small values. It creates a new nexus between the families and the financial systems by opening bank accounts, then through the possibility that with this uh, income, regular flow of income, people start taking loans. So there is a process of indebtedness that is generalized, different from the rich countries where the family debtedness is 70% tops on over a mortgage so that people can buy housing. On the third world countries, two thirds of the debts of the families is credit for consumption. That is currently via the demo democratization of finance, of financial inclusion. People get indebted to pay for energy bills, water bills, to buy medicine, to pay for their children's education, because it's not the salary, it's not their own wages that allow them to do that. But vis-a-vis -vis the austerity policies that made the state retract and the poverty all over to 
grow this financial system occupy the place of the state offering loans and you can get a loan for anything you need an immediate consequence is that the sphere of life reproduction today is much more expensive it's much more expensive to live you have to besides paying for energy for medicine for water people pay interest over that and that leads to accumulation of the financial system. So the reproduction of the system of the families that was via work, via economic activities. Now, instead of improving due to access to credit, it is worse because the social cost of the families to reproduce is much higher because they pay interest over the loans they incur. And when we think about uh, cash transfers being one of the main policy responses in the context of the pandemic when so many people had to stay home for, for a long time, those that could afford it, which brings it to, to our question and our topic today, can, what do we what can we think about the the expansion of cash transfers during this this period what does it say and and, and how is the financial sector uh, doing in this context ah this is a very pertinent question indeed before the crisis of coronavirus in 2019 the beginning of 2020 the level of indebtedness of families all over the world was already high. The IMF made a, a report in 2017 calling the attention of everybody that there could be a systemic risk for the financial sector if the families, if they weren't able to pay their debts. I'm going to give you an example of Brazil. According to the Brazilian Central Bank, today the profitability of the banks is ensured by the credit given to the families, not the credit given to the companies. Companies capture money in the capital markets, in the, uh, the capital markets, uh, selling their equities for pension funds, but those who guarantee the profitability of the banks today are the families. 56% of the profitability of the Brazilian banks in 2020 came from the loans given to families. Those are very small loans because the rich people are not getting into debt. It's the popular classes, the working classes, that are indebted. When the pandemic arrived, everybody was already indebted. According to the Chilean Central Bank, 73% of the income of a family on the last year, on average, is to pay for the loans that the families did on the financial sector. In Brazil, before the pandemic, this level was 52%, now it's 60%. What happened during the pandemic? If you remember the crisis of 08, the bailout that came for, through the economic policies was for the banks, for the companies, and the families were abandoned. In 2020, it was radically different. The bailout was given to the families, and for the very first time, Lots of money was spent transferring this income, firstly, for informal workers that were never addressed beforehand, poor families that had cash transfer programs for them, unemployed workers. So Brazil spent 4.1% of the GDP with the program Bolsa Familia. In Argentina, it was around 3% of the GDP. The new programs that the government, uh, the Fernandes government, implemented during the pandemic. The North Americans 
gave lots of money. They more than doubled the unemployment insurance. They have uh, uh, also cash transfers. So this had two very important impacts. This helped the families, of course, families that were going through hunger. So we had a better food security. It uh, grew. The families had to pay uh, bills and they had no income. So this money came in a good time. But in Brazil, 60% of the 67 million people who received this emergency help that was around for five months $130 a month, which is a lot. It's 60% of the minimum salary in Brazil. Never in Brazil such uh, amount of money was given in Brazil. Everybody and everywhere received good money so that economy wouldn't collapse. What did people do with this money? 60% of those that in Brazil received the emergency money, they went to the bank to pay debts. Why? Because people were indebted in the banks and they were defaulting in their payments. After three or four months, you are late in your payments, then you default, you stop paying, you are in debt in the bank, and your name is put in a list, in a blacklist, and you cannot have credit anymore. Everybody knew that there was unemployment, but what did people do? They went to the bank to pay their debts, and when they paid the debt, they could renegotiate an expansion of their debts. So they paid what was late, they were able to uh, break even and clear their names on the banks, and they had the opportunity of renegotiating and expanding their debts in the banks in better conditions because they extended their uh, due date for payment. So the cycle of indebtedness of the families was rebuilt due to the support that they had from the states at that moment of crisis. This is a dimension. Another important one that we have to highlight is that the rich became even richer. Where, whereas the families went to the bank to renegotiate their debts because they know they need the banks to uh, face the payments they have, everything is monetized, we pay for everything. The rich became richer in 2021. Forbes, that is a magazine that measures the richness or the wealth of the billionaires, because we don't have millionaires anymore, we have billionaires. Between 2020 to 2021, the number of billionaires increased. It's 2,755 people. 2,755 people that own $13 trillion. I have to tell you that the GDP of China is 14 trillion dollars. The GDP of Europe as a whole is 15 trillion dollars. So that is to just say to you that 2,755 people, people who have open capital companies in the stock market, because that's how they, their financial wealth grows, they have practically the same wealth of all of Europe and China. The whole GDP of Africa is $2.6 trillion. It's one-sixth of what these billionaires have. We find ourselves in, then in this context in which this bailout that was supposed to be, you know, reaching people directly really went into the financial sector and it's expanding its power uh, that we see, for example, in the growth of billionaires uh, 
uh, in the context of a, of a structural crisis that we're living in. Um, because we're running out of time and we want to be able to have time to listen to our comments and also uh, to address some questions, I invite you to, as synthetically as you can, uh, think with us and, and share your thoughts about another way of doing things and how, how can we think beyond the trap of financialization uh, in, in, in a more just and, and feminist uh, perspective. I think that uh, besides being exploited in the work, we are expropriated by the financial sector. The lack of public services in healthcare, healthcare is totally financialized as a sector. Even philanthropy, you only invest in philanthropy if you have financial returns. Those who are behind the platforms of investment in Africa and other poor countries are investment funds, financial funds. The most important thing we have to understand that we have to go back to reconstruct the community sphere, the public sphere. This is the most important thing because besides capitalism, meaning the concentration of wealth as shares and papers and equity, uh, a wealth that is not taxed, you don't pay income tax over this wealth, it doesn't come back to the common good. The mindset of people has changed. We don't have the, the mindset of an entrepreneur because each one of us has to do whatever we have to do. So now people are investors. We have small investors, people who make little money because the logic is everything I do must bring me a financial return because that's how the rich become rich. So we have to understand, and this is a must, why it's not only we pay for education and so on and so forth. The fact that we pay is leading us to a concentration of wealth in the financial sphere. What we have to try to do is to get back to us the public sphere that was destroyed. And from then onwards, try to create collective dynamics to face this situation because it's totally unequal. How can we definancialize our economies? This I don't know, but the struggle of uh, the indigenous communities in Latin America against the, the domination of the water sources by the Chinese groups, the financial groups, is a way of struggling against financialization. We have to occupy our territories. We have to have a collective capacity for organizations, and we women know how to do that. We must have alliances with the popular sectors, the middle tier sectors also, because the middle tier sectors are also expropriated from the point of view of finance. So we have to have a rupture with the financial logic that the only way out is private uh, retirement, the individual accounts of workers and everybody has to accumulate wealth. Of course, that facing a dramatic situation such as the one we are living through, we end up, I think this is the only way out. But I think that we women can consolidate and strengthen all the collected dynamics in the sphere of our communities. It's not simple. It may seem simple, but it's not. It's a long way, but the understanding that we have to fight against this understanding of what is at stake and these ways of disappropriation is a must. Thank you, Elena. And, and, and I know there is so much to say about this um, and hopefully we can continue the conversation um, about these ways forward and thinking collectively and, and reappropriating uh, the public space uh, 
among collectives and, and from with a collective point of view uh, based on, on, on the common good. Uh, we invited and, and we have three uh, amazing women to, to comment on this conversation and add uh, different perspectives to it. Uh, first, we will have uh, a comment from Busi Sibeko, who is an economist and researcher at the Institute of Economic Justice in Johannesburg in South Africa, and followed by a comment by Corina Rodriguez Enrique, uh, Don's own um, member, uh, part of the executive committee, and also an expert in social protection and care and, and feminist economies economics. And, and lastly, we'll have comments from Gita Sen, is uh, one of the founding members of Dawn, uh, also part of the executive committee, one of its co-coordinators. Uh, she is a feminist economist and has decades of work in, in issues of feminist economics and, and public health, among many, many other things. So, Busi, the floor is yours. Thank you, um, and thank you for really for inviting me to this platform. I'm just reflecting on um, Lena's inputs, particularly with regards to um, cash transfers and financial capitalism, and some of the things you mentioned there, Lena, are so prevalent in our country. I mean, you know, as we know in South Africa, we've got supposedly. I start. I started saying supposedly instead of a well-established social assistance uh, program because I think. You know, it's it's who you ask in terms of who's supported and who's excluded, um, and who isn't getting enough from it. I think are critical questions um, to be asked. And so sometimes when we say well-established social assistance program, everyone thinks everyone is doing well, which is not necessarily true because in South Africa we've got this triple challenge of poverty, unemployment, and inequality, um, which of course the crisis has really exacerbated. Um, and so very interestingly. Um, in in our established social assistance program, we've traditionally given cash transfers um, to children below 18 who come from disadvantaged families. We've got an old age grant, which is basically everybody of retirement age um, who's able to have income support, um, people living with disabilities, and basically children in foster care or children living with disabilities. So we've basically covered people who are not part of the labor market as we traditionally think of it. And so, in, so because of this, we've had a long standing um, gap in the 18 to 59 age group because these are working adults or people should be working. Um, and we've traditionally not provided um, income support to this group. But of course, COVID came and gave us a, a array of progressivity as I, as I would call it. Um, for the first time, our government introduced what is called um, a special relief of distress grant, um, which isn't much really. It equates to less than $1 a day um, for those who do not have employment. Um, and this has been implemented from last year Although in a stop-start manner, um, and I'll explain why it's been a stop-start manner. Um, so they introduced it um, and then announced that it had ended because of course the crisis had ended six months later, which is not what really happened. Um, and so there was a premature withdrawal of social support. Um, and the reason for this is because we are in the context of austerity, which you, you know, Lena partly mentioned. So there's a resistance to expand and increase the social protection because we are in the fiscal framework broadly um, that is concerned with reducing the size of the budget itself. And so debt, and this is where the financialized capitalism, particularly in South Africa, is critical. Um, as, as you know, obviously, South Africa has got a very established financial system, one, or financialized system, but also, you know, this concept of debt as a global financial architecture problem. Um, and so in South Africa, debt has become the reason for why we are being um, forced upon with austerity, right? Um, and we hear the finance minister say a lot um, that, you know, the, the national budget is like a household. We cannot spend what we do not have. Um, you know, with the public sector wage bill is too large um, and needs to be reduced and so forth. And so in a way, um, we are, a victim to the way in which the debt conversation 
um, happens at a global level and its interlinkages to austerity and neoliberalism, as you, you rightly point out. Um, and so where we are now is that civil society, in fact, they've been arguing for this since 2002, is to say we need a universal basic income grant to really support this 18 to 59 group. We are really in a crisis where the black working class particularly women who've got the highest unemployment in our country, are unable to socially reproduce themselves. It is no longer viable. Um, South Africa hasn't been a viable society for a very long time. And of course, the pushback against the universal basic income grant is again, debt, um, we don't have, we can't afford it. Um, and, and that will create dependency. Um, and so in that short input, I think my time has run out. I'm, I'm trying not to be a rogue panelists, um, but to say that, you know, these are the interactions that are detrimental when we think about the program finance, what I'll call it, and how it intersects with our physical policies, particularly of social protection, um, which, you know, leads to these perverse outcomes, um, especially in a country where labor is no longer as important to capital as it used to be. Because remember, South Africa's economy was built on cheap labor. Um, and so now we are moving towards financialized systems and so forth. And therefore, labor is no longer as you know considered as, as important and people has moved on. Um, that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Busi. And of course, the, the conversation about universal income is one that, that we continue to, to have and, and that is very much on the table among social justice groups like, like ourselves. Um, now I invite Corina to, to add her, her part to the conversation. Thanks, Masaya. And thank you so much, Lena, for such an illuminated uh, conversation. Uh, I, I fully support everything that you said and, and this idea of uh, cash transfer working as collateral. Uh, during the pandemic, it was not only that, it was also directly uh, giving credits to informal workers. In, in Argentina, one of the programs was that the, the government was not giving these workers cash, but they are allowing them to get in debt with their credit card uh, at a lower interest rate. So it's, it's directly, you know, the state uh, distributing debt to, to people. It's, it's really very shocking. And, and I would like to build on what uh, Busi brought about the basic income proposal as well. Um, Lena and I have shared in the past uh, long conversations about basic income and the basic income proposal uh, was uh, historically resisted from feminist perspectives. Um, although I personally found it uh, a, a provocative proposal, in, in, at least in two issues that uh, were, uh, from my point of view, uh, something that made the proposal, the basic income proposal, superior of conditional cash transfer. One was that uh, avoiding conditionalities, in a way, they, the basic income proposal reduced the social control and that this was especially relevant for women because uh, the degree of feminization of the conditional cash transfer. But for me, the, the most provoking part of the basic income proposal uh, was how it challenged the, the role of, 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 of the capitalist notion of, of labor. Uh, and in this way, it gave room for recognizing uh, unpaid care work and uh, many of the activities that, that women uh, do. And, and then when some feminists were looking at this and saying, oh, maybe basic income <laughs> could be, then we realized that, oh, there is also this risk, risk of basic income being a collateral for more uh, indebtedness. And also uh, this uh, uh, discussion of, are we building citizenship from consumerism? Are, 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 are we supporting citizens or are we supporting consumers? That was part of the criticism to, to the basic income. Uh, and now it's not only citizens through cons consumerism, but it's citizenship through indebtedness. So my, 
my point here to, to think it further is whether there is a way to think about basic income, uh, not only with the, this possible risk of being a collateral for more household debts, but whether it can be a collateral for non-capitalist way of doing things. And I, I'll try to explain this idea. Mm -hmm. um, in, in Argentina, for example, uh, there, there is a wave of using conditional gas transfer to support what we call economia popular, popular economy. I don't know whether the, the, the word makes sense in English, but it's this idea of people who really do work in their communities, in their neighborhoods, in a non-capitalist way, with, I, with uh, uh, values of solidarity, of producing from their own land, um, in a community-based organization. And many times, this kind of community-based organization of production and reproduction cannot uh, survive because of the lack of income. So I wonder whether if people receive basic income, they can have this at least basic income to survive until this non-capitalist way of producing and reproducing gets stronger. And in line of what you, Lena, were saying about the, uh, the way out of this is the common, the community, uh, so whether basic income can be thought about a transition or like a transition to this community-based uh, arrangement for production and, and reproduction. And, and my last point would be uh, whether this process or in this process, should we reclaim the state or, or should we think about organizing, you know, not counting with the state. Because in Argentina, for example, this support to popular economy kind of initiatives have the support of public policies. Can we do it without the state or do we still need to reclaim the state for the interests of people and not from, for the interests of profit? Thank you. Thank you, Cori. And, and the, the idea of how to move away from this, this trap in which we're in is, is, is very much pressing. Um, and we, we hope to hear Gita, <laughs> Gita's thoughts about this. The floor is yours, Gita. Thank you. So one of the problems of coming in at the end of this very wide ranging discussion of issues is that my brain feels like it's going all <laughs> over the place. Um, I have 17 ideas jostling for space um, and articulation at the same time. Um, so let me um, just say one thing in response to Karina's last question. Do we reclaim the state? I think absolutely yes. Uh, but let me come back to that um, at the end. So I want to make basically three points, I think. Um, the first is a mac macro, meso, micro. Uh, let me put it that way. Let me start with the macro. I think it's very important for us to really understand the nature of this beast that we are confronting right now completely because um, in the early 1980s, when we were all you know, struggling with the spin-offs from the Reagan-Thatcher revolution, the Washington consensus, uh, structural adjustment programs, um, and so on, the words that were the sort of key to that were globalization, liberalization and privatization, not financialization. Financialization is a Johnny come lately to this scene. And it's very important for us to recognize that there are phases in what has been happening to us since that first period when uh, neoliberal globalization 
um, started. Now, I don't have the time and I don't want to spend um, time here going into what these two phases are, but I do think it's really important for us to recognize how finance from being in a sense, the handmaiden of the search for profits and opening up the world to profit making by large corporations and being able to take, you know, earn profits, recover those profits, and therefore to keep exchange rates stable, et cetera. How finance has gone from being the support for that to becoming the driver of the process, but let's not get, I can't get into the, you know, my questions about the details and thoughts about the details of that. But I think what's important for us to recognize is that at the same time, while in the first phase, it was largely about privatization in the second phase of financialization, it is about public-private partnerships as well. So the state from being pushed out has been brought back in, but it's been brought back in in a very particular role, exactly to ensure that the debts and the risks which in the financial era are much higher for investors because of the nature of what finance has become are in fact, there is somebody to bear them. And who is it that has to bear them? Governments. So what used to be sovereign national debts and the struggles with odious debt in that first phase have become the struggles with public-private partnerships and privatization, but where the risk is all on governments at this point through public-private partnerships. The name of the game in both phases, central to it is austerity. But I think in this phase, austerity has become even more fundamentally written into the system. Because when you start inviting pension funds in Europe to start putting their money into financing infrastructure in low-income countries, it's a bit risky, to put it mildly. And not only is it a bit risky, you're also promising them huge returns. What that means is you build physical infrastructure, you build roads and bridges, and then you price them such that 80% of people cannot use them. You convert health and education into PPPs, which then means that they largely exclude 80% of people, or if you include them, government bears both the risk and the cost. So it's a way of bringing, tying governments even more tightly into austerity policies are absolutely the URL of this system, even more so, I would say, than in the first phase. So this brings me to the meso level. For quite some time, we know, and I'm talking now about the pandemic, let's just focus on health. For quite some time, it's been well known, at least since Zika in, in Latin America and the late worst last of the Ebola pandemics 2014-15 in West Africa, that health systems needed really to be significantly built up. And there are beautiful reports that spell out all of the things that should have been done. Were they done? Of course not. They're not done because in fact, we're busy PPPing the health system in, this, in the interim. And in the process of doing that, 
what it means is that health has become less and less. Public health is not a public good anymore. And we see this very clearly in the context of the pandemic. Not only are health systems, in fact, in terrible shape, they will continue to be in terrible shape after this pandemic. Noises will be made, we need to prepare better for the next pandemic, and nothing will happen unless fundamental changes happen to the structure of the system beyond health itself at the macro level. Now, reclaiming the public in terms of the pandemic is why many of us, including Dawn and Third World Network have been saying we, need, we support the TRIPS waiver. Um, and that is one way of saying that intellectual property is a public good. It's not and should not be allowed to continue private. So the, my, the third level is actually it, probably the one, the micro level raises the biggest challenges because in as much, and I think there's one at least question in the Q&A about this, in as much in upper middle income countries like Brazil and Argentina, household financialization may be seen as a challenge. The financial inclusion of poor households is the absolute name of the game in lower middle income and low income countries. How do you make it possible for poor people, in fact, to be able to participate in the system? And I think we will have a huge challenge arguing against financial inclusion in the poorer, um, um, in the poorer countries. Now, I would argue that the challenge that we are seeing at the micro level in the upper middle income countries of this collateralization of private household debt is partly a symptom of the more fundamental problem that, that Lina, you mentioned yourself, which is that there is no public sector left. Public services have collapsed. So people have to buy everything. You have to pay for your health, you have to pay for your education, you have to pay for um, you know, um, social insurance and having, and you have to pay for all of those things because the public sector isn't there. And that's where the challenge of the macro of keeping a strong hold on public sector spending and, and, and disciplining governments through harsh austerity policies. I mean, think about the ridiculousness in the middle of the pandemic in 2021 and 2022, over 150 countries are implementing austerity policies and will be implementing austerity policies next year. In the middle of the pandemic, what are we talking about here? And that's why I say austerity has been written into the bones of the system completely. And that is why we have to fight for um, reclaiming and recreating the public sphere so that people are not so dependent at the micro level on private debt so that you can have financial inclusion of those who need to be financially included, but without its automatically meaning private debt, household debt going through the, through the roof because people's debt becomes only one thing that people can use in order to survive. But I think fundamentally going back to the macro level is tax justice. This crap 15% corporate tax nonsense that the rich countries have agreed to and which will in effect take all of the taxes that are garnered, the bulk of it 
back to Europe and North America, um, the poor we everybody else has been complaining, saying this is not we, what we meant by tax justice. We need tax justice so that, in fact, it is possible for our governments, our states, to be able to pay for the services that to finance core health, core education, core basic incomes, core social security, um, and uh, very importantly, um, uh, to be able to regulate the digital economy whose technology is powering this financialization in a big way as well. So let me stop with that. And I'm sorry, it took me a little while to get to those three points. Um, well, I think we have all been very glad to have you take the, the, the time you needed. Uh, it's been quite a challenge for me to be able to follow and uh, and also follow the chat at the same time in a way that is inclusive of everybody's point of view and it's mindful of time. So I will take the liberty to kind of point out main points that have been uh, brought up in the chat and the uh, Q&A box uh, and bring them to the conversation. Uh, now, after that, Lena, you have uh, five minutes to kind of address <laughs> them. <laughs> I know it's a challenge. Um, uh, before we then uh, move on to, to close our talk for today. Um, I think one key question that is coming through and, and, a, and a common concern is, is recovering uh, the public space. Uh, I was very glad to, to hear you, Gita, speak about tax justice because it's a structural point that is also kind of lagging behind the rhetoric of austerity. Um, that, that it's something that perhaps is one of the tools we have at hand to address this, this narrative of, of austerity and also this chronic indebtedness that we're, that we're experiencing uh, at every level. And that's one of the uh, key points that is brought by Rania De Vito. Uh, another point uh, brought uh, also is, is the risk of uh, refinancializing or buying into the refinancializing uh, process through um, these universal basic income initiatives, how to move away from that, which is something that I know Purina, yeah. Busi, and Gita have mentioned. And finally, uh, the, the struggle to, to recover the public sphere from the, the brutal concentration of wealth and also the brutal concentration of power that comes with it. Uh, what experiences can we think about uh, that can help us think about this uh, in a democratic way, uh, in a way that is not allured by, by autocracy and, and, and authoritarian approaches, uh, which are also quite alive and well uh, these days in, in, in the world. Um, very easy task, Lena. <laughs> you have five minutes. <coughs> Well, fantastic. I think we need uh, two more hours, but uh, we don't have them. Well, I'm going to speak in Portuguese, and I would like to thank, first of all, all the comments that have been made. I have five minutes, and I'm going to be very straightforward. We have to build new political coalitions. There's no way out of that. Either we redefine the progressive field in the world, because those who led us to this dramatic situation we are in today was the failure of social democracy in Europe, the failure of the left-wing uh, governments in Latin America. So we have to rethink how we are going to rebuild, reconstruct the political uh, coalitions or coalitions. All the process of decolonization in Africa was a disaster and we cannot uh, have good leaderships today. It's a, dra a dramatic situation in Africa. Mainly, many countries are still at war, so the process of decolonization hasn't ended up yet. So in our countries, we have to see that we feminists have to participate in the building of new progressive political 
coalitions because that's the only way to go forward. And I, myself, can't see how to do that right now because when the state started uh, spending lots of money last year, many people thought the state is back in. No, the state is just maintaining the same reasoning of the sustainability of financial systems. And that's what we have seen. What happened in Brazil for the families to pay their debts, the same thing happened in the US, where the level of default of the families dropped in the crisis, whereas in 08, it went up because there was no bailout for these families. So the financial capitalism understands how the world works. I would like to go back to two issues. I think that the most important thing we have to rebuild is the public sphere, because the social and the public are the only places where we can all meet in an equal fashion, where everybody is equal. Only in the public sphere this is possible, and that is there where we take care of one another, where we can develop our potentials, and where we can benefit from the wealth that has been accumulated by society as a result of people's work. And this is the victory of neoliberalism against us, the uh, destruction of the public sphere. The PPPs are one dimension of uh, financialization, and it is a very uh, dangerous one. The NHS here in England, that was an example of a public health care system, today has totally uh, collapsed. In the last six years, it received 13 billion pounds of loans to be able to take care of its needs, but it will have to pay back 80 billion pounds. Just to show you how the financial logic expropriates, you needed 13 billion for making hospitals working, paying salaries, buy input, medicine, and now you have to pay back 80 million. That means the following, the only way of definancializing the world, because the private equity funds, you know that, these funds, different from the pension funds and investment funds, those are private funds that take money from companies and ventures and the wealthy people, and they uh, try to find sectors and companies that are undergoing problems to rebuild them, to restructure them. And the private equity funds used to invest mainly, that's why they last seven to 10 years because they restructure the companies and they participate in this restructuring. So they decide what's going to be done. The private equity funds used to invest in technology and infrastructure. Nowadays, they invest mainly in healthcare. To give you an idea, between 2009 and 2015, there was a research conducted, and we know that the most profitable sector for the private equity funds was the healthcare sector. One dollar that was invested had as a result 1.5 dollars as a return. We think that the state has invested a lot. The state really uh, spent a lot of money, but it didn't change the financial logic of the banks, of the financial pension funds, and so on and so forth. And the only way to change that, and I can assure you it's going to be difficult, is to have a radical change from the point of view of taxing the wealth in the world. Like Gita said, for the state to finance our services, because today in Brazil, 
the National Health Fund that is from the federal government and it's the taxpayers' money that goes to the municipalities. The municipalities issue papers to be sold in the market so that they receive more money because the Health Care National Fund cannot stand alone. So they issue those papers at all levels municipal, state, and federal. And we are all indebted. Those who gain are the banks, are those who own the debt, the security markets. So, we have to tax wealth. And that's the main issue. And before talking about the basic income, I'd like to say that if we are not able to tax wealth, I'm going to talk about Mr. Musk, who is the most the richest man in the world. He makes electric cars and the space X that's going to take people to outer space, commercial trips to outer space to make money. So his company in four months uh, increased in 40 billion his uh, equity. How much does he pay for tax? Zero. Because he's not using his equity as a personal income. So he pays zero. for Because the tax system uh, goes after income and not equity. So in 2018, Mr. Musk paid zero of income tax return. Musk and Mr. Bezos also, they take loans. They take the billions they have in shares. They go to a financial entity and say, well, I have 57 billion in shares. Can you loan me some money? So they take the loan and they leave over the loan they have. This is not an income. This is a liability. If you have a debt, you don't pay income tax over a debt. So we have a tax system. I don't know if you can understand, but the system, the tax system we have accumulates wealth and it favors the debts of the very wealthy and not the poor. Those who spend money to survive, and this is unacceptable. People have to pay uh, interest to eat the biggest debt of the Americans for credit cards is foodstuff. They pay to eat. So, Gita is right. We must go over a reform for the tax system. There is hope. Mr. Biden wants to make 700 families to pay taxes, those who make more than $1 million per year or have an equity that is bigger than $1 million, and they make more than $100 million a year. That's 700 people. They want to make them pay income tax for three years on a row, 20% of their wealth, because then he would obtain one trillion and a half dollars to finance the social programs he wants to finance. Even the parental license of 12 months so that uh, women and those who have children can stop working to take care of small children and also their families, the elderly and their families. And it, he was not able to do that. The Congress in the U.S. said, let's take the parental license from Mr. Biden's package because it is expensive. So it was refused. It was denied. So if we don't have a global coalition against the financial elites, I don't know how we can go forward in this coalition. Going back to the basic income, I've always defended the citizenship basic income. 
if you have that in the Fordist economy is one thing, but to have that in a financial economy is totally different, a financialized economy. To sum up, it's no use imagining that if I don't have a series of services that are necessary for me to live, and there is, instead of UPI, it's UBS, Universal Basic Services. If I don't have a change in the provision, what is a PPP, what is a health care, uh, education that has to be universal and free for all, the same education for all, and don't have uh, community colleges for one, a group, and big universities, Ivy League universities for others. If you can't have social housing, in Berlin there has been a referendum and they voted that we have to uh, take away that 280 units for housing from the hands of the pension funds because poor people cannot afford that. Uh, citizenship basic income that is uh, uh, urged by both the left and the right, everybody thinks this is a solution. It won't be an element of reorganizing our lives, of restructuring capitalism in uh, the direction of solidarity and not profit-based if we are not able to demercantilize everything that is basic to life's reproduction. We are going to have a worsening of the dimension of collateralization. Instead of social policies supporting demercantilization, it's going to support re-mercantilization via financialization. Corina, currently, with all the digital technologies, we don't have any conditions because via the digital uh, era, it is feasible. During the pandemic, there was no condition conditionality to cash transfer to the workers. The moral dimension of the cash transfers is not necessary anymore. I control the moral of the poor by them paying the debts they have. It's better than asking them to take children to their children to school because the school system is no good. So we have major challenges ahead of us. And the solutions today would at least suppose a, a, a bigger framework. This week, Enough is Enough has been launched, which is a major coalition to guarantee public services, basic public services. And the major companies, the major financial companies, have to get out of healthcare systems from these billionaires 2,755 of those, 80% of those billionaires are in the healthcare sector and they are owners of fabrics of vaccines, hospitals, clinics, and laboratories. This is unacceptable. We have to dismantle that. It's a humongous challenge, but in a globalized world, we have to try and build new coalitions that are more radical than the ones we built in the past. I would like to thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this talk, and I hope we can do this again. Thank you so much, Lena, and I'm, I'm sorry we're running out of time, so I won't have time to say much more than thank you uh, to our interpreters that have been working super hard. We're very glad to have you and we're glad for your generosity for staying a couple extra minutes as we close today. I want to thank Busi, Corina uh, and Gita for, for chipping in and, and adding so much 
uh, depth and context and and uh, texture to the conversation that Lena has been so generous in, in leading uh, today. I want to thank the participants that have been very active in the chat. Um, and thank you all for joining us. And before we close today, I, I want to leave uh, a couple of minutes for Gita uh, to close also the, the series of Don Talks that we have had for the during this year. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Um, thank you, Masaya, and I won't really won't take two minutes. I had forgotten that I had promised you I would do this, uh, but I'm just here wearing my hat as the, one of Dawn's two general co-coordinators. The other one is somewhere. MG, can you show your face, please? Um, and um, I think I speak for both of us on behalf of Dawn. We've had this is the second year uh, that we've been doing this, these Dawn Talks. Um, uh, and we've done four this year, all focused on the uh, pandemic or pandemic related um, questions. Um, so um, we, um, this is probably a tradition we are likely to continue. And who knows if there is an appetite uh, we may do more than four in 2022. But I want to thank um, all of the participants, the, first of all, the speakers in all of these, the um, participants, uh, the interpreters, the tech team, um, and uh, the Dawn um, EC members and associates and supporters who've really made these possible. Um, uh, I think we, the one thing that we've all learned from these, I think this year we've been focusing on pretty tough issues, like you can see from today's talk, um, and issues that often feminists sort of, you know, sideways shy away from. Um, not only on financialization, but on things like the TRIPS waiver and WTO TRIPS and things like that. Uh, but we've had a very strong participation, and I think it shows that there is both a real appetite among feminists to grapple with these issues and to come up with our ideas for ways to transcend them. Um, and also it comes, um, as we were saying, uh, as Lena said early on, it comes from the fact that there is such a desperate need for our voices to be heard. So thank you all for being here with us. I don't know, MG, if you want to say something or um, other than saying <laughs> bye and <laughs> thank you. But thank you all so much. Thank you, everybody.